Section 4. Patent Infringements Defenses and Remedies This section is about uh, any potential defenses available to a defendant in a patent litigation. It's also about potential remedies that might be available to the plaintiff, the patent owner, or any injured party who was suffering from the infringements. The primary defenses in a patent case usually include, for instance, number one, the patent is invalid. In this case, the defendant is arguing that the patent at the issue here in this case should never have stood in the first place. This patent owned by the patent owner was granted by the patent office by a mistake. So the defendant is challenging the validity of the patent. Under the current Chinese law, the Civil Procedure Law of China, the Patent Law of China. The court does not have the power to decide on the validity issue of the patent. So the court hearing this case here would suspend the trial, allowing the parties to go up to Beijing for the following proceedings. The challenger that the defendant would uh, have to go up to the patent office in Beijing, initiating the invalidation proceeding. The decision delivered by the PRB patent review board of the patent office would be sued in the Beijing RP court if either party is not happy with the opinion delivered by the PRB and then that appeal would be heard by the Beijing RP court the decision by the Beijing RP court could be appealed to the Beijing High Court for the final judgments. After the validity issue is settled by those proceedings, in those proceedings, the two parties, the plaintiff and defendant, would be back to the previous court hearing the litigation issue. Number two, the accused X is not infringing because the defendant has not committed an infringing act at all. For instance, the accused infringing act is done in private and for non-commercial purposes. For example, you bought uh, an infringing product on the market and use it for your own private purpose. The buying and using the infringing item for your own private purpose is not an infringement. Number three, the alleged infringing product or process is not covered by the claims asserted by the plaintiff. The court, of course, would have the power to decide on the interpretation of the claims. The court would uh, decide on the very basic issue whether the technical features contained in the alleged product is identical to or equivalent to the 
technical features covered by the claim of the plant here. If not, it means the invention patented by the plant here is different from the technologies being used for the making of the products by the defendant at issue. So the defendant, of course, would not be held for li li for any liability for for any infringements because uh, the plaintiff failed to establish patent infringements. At in addition to those uh, possible defenses raised in uh, patent litigation case by the defendants. There are another group of uh, defenses that might be available to the defendants. That is defined under the patent law explicitly to limit the scope of the exclusive rights granted to the patent owner. These defenses are called statutory defenses, which could be interpreted as statutory limitations on the exclusive rights granted to the patent owner. Number one, exhaustion of patent rights. The exclusive rights conferred on the patent owner allows the patent owner to control the doing of a set of acts. As we explained earlier, this act subject to the permission of a patent owner includes the acts of making, offering to sell, selling, importing the products for commercial purposes. However, these rights are not li without limited. After the sale of a patented product on the marketplace, the buyers of the product will be allowed to dispose those products at their own will because um, those products as tangible properties will be owned by those buyers. You bought a machine for on the marketplace under the permission of the patent owner. You would become the owner of that machine. That would be your property. So on the machine, there are different civil rights. You own the ownership of the machine, your property rights in the machine. Meanwhile, the patent owner would own his or her patent rights in the machine as well. So now the owners and the patent owners, the owners of the tangible property, the products, and the owners of the intangible property, the patents, would both have some sorts of legal rights in one object. Now, the rights of the tangible properties would be in conflict with the rights of uh, intangible properties, the patents. It's a well established that the owner of the property should be allowed to dispose at his or her own properties. The rights of patent owner under these circumstances 
should be limited. Otherwise, how can the market economy be operating? The transfer of ownership of properties should not be restricted. So this principle means after the sale of the patented products, under the permission of the patent owner, the subsequent transfer of the ownership and the use of the products would be exhausted. Put it another way, if the patented products were put on the marketplace for sale, of course were made and sold under the permission of the patent owner, the buyers of the tangible products would be allowed to use the products to sell the products again on the second hand market or to import the products which were put on the market under the permission of the patent owner. To rely on the exhaustion of rights, the buyers or owners of the tangible products must make sure that that patent products, the tangible items owned by him or her or legitimate product. This means that products were made and sold on the marketplace under the permission of the patent owner. One more thing to be careful. Exhaustion of patent rights is uh, limited to the domestic market or universally exhausted. For instance, in a global market, the products available in China and that exactly the same products available in Africa, in the US, in Japan, could be priced on different grounds. The Coca-Cola, for instance, that bottle of Coca-Cola, 3 RMB in China for one bottle, it could be 1 Euro in Europe, which would be around 5 to 7 RMB. In the US, it could be 1 US dollar, which would be around 6 RMB. So the price of the products could uh, be different in different uh, markets, in different countries. Would it be allowable for you to buy 10,000 bottle, 10, bottles of uh, Coca-Cola in China at the price of 2 or 3 RMB? and sell it on the market in Europe at the price of 1 euro or 2 euro. In the case of a patent, the patent law of China now make, has made it very clear the exhaustion of patent rights is exhausted internationally. It means it is legitimate 
to buy a number of uh, items, patented products, at a lower price from a country where the price much lower than another country and import those products to this country. So that's parallel importation. The answers to national or international exhaustion will be critical to the legitimacy of parallel importation. If the rights is exhausted nationally, not internationally, then international exhaustion will not be acknowledged. It would mean patent owners would be allowed to control the flow of the patent products on the international markets. Whereas in the case of a trademark and copyrights, the national exhaustion or international exhaustion issue in many countries have not been settled as in many cases it's a more than an intellectual property issue. It's highly reliant on international trade or the reality of the manufacturing industry or the entire national economy of that country. Number two, prior use defense. As we explained earlier, under current Chinese patent law, following so called force to fire principle, not the force to invent principle, it is highly possible in practice the one who has successfully patented an invention might not be the one who truly invented it first. If it happened, the one who truly invented it this invention first will not be allowed to use his or her invention because it would be infringing. However, there's a one exception. If this invention had been used already before the date of filing, then it could be used within the original scope without permission from the patent owner. How could this be possible? Well, for instance, you invented an invention, but uh, you had no plan to patent it for many reasons. It could be possible that you just want to keep it as a secret and use it as a secret or license it to a third party to use it in a contract. You just don't want to patent it. You already use this invention to make product and the products are already on the market for quite a long time, or it has not been put on the market, but uh, you have made sufficient preparation for the making of the products. If you were not allowed to keep doing this, it would cause significant damages to you and it looks quite unfair to you, right? So to balance the interests of the true inventor who already implemented his or her invention and the rights 
who successfully patented it. The law makes it an exception that the use prior to the date of filing will be legal. The true inventor in this case could keep doing this without permission from the patent owner, but it must be limited to what he or she, the true inventor, has been doing. That's it. You cannot move beyond what you have been doing. Using the terminology on the Chinese law, the prior use defense must be limited to the original scope of the use. Therefore, to maintain this prior use defense, you must make sure that the use of the invention making the products implementing this invention took place before the date of filing of the patent. In addition, the prior use must have not lead to the disclosure of the invention. In that case, if the use of the invention before the date of filing, then from that use, the public may already learn the details of this invention. It means before the date of filing, the invention had already been disclosed to the public. If this could be established, what would happen? Well, the patent granted to the patent owner would be invalidated because before the date of filing, the invention was already available to the public. It's been disclosed to the public already. So it was actually not a novel invention. Before the date of, of uh, filing, any disclosure of the invention to the public would amount to the loss of a novelty of the invention. But uh, in the case of prior use, that use is not causing the consequences that the public already have no access to the details of the invention. Number three, temporary entry into China. If the products, the patented products, were shipped to another country and the ship just uh, passed by Chinese territory, that would not be considered as patent infringements on the Chinese patent law. As if destination of these shipments is a North Chinese market. Number four. Scientific research and experiments, not for commercial purposes. The use of the patented invention could be legitimate on this ground. Number five, clinical trials.
there could be other possible defenses, but uh, not for within the scope of for statutory defenses, which cannot be considered as uh, as a statutory limitations or exceptions to the exclusive rights granted to the patent owner. In these cases, for instance, breach of anti-monopoly law or non-infringement because the patent has been incorporated in a standard. In these cases, the defendant might not be held liable for infringement simply because that's not a breach of uh, patent law. The plaintiff might already breach the relevant legislation, for instance, unfair competition law or anti-monopoly law. In a sense, as a defense to damages, as we explained earlier, to establish a patent infringement, it is doesn't matter whether in the infringer were innocent or not. The court would not consider the mental elements of the infringer in order to establish a patent infringement. However, if the infringer may convince the court that he or she was innocent, was not aware of the fact that the selling or the use or the offering selling importing of the product at issue were actually infringing product. Then the infringer, the innocent infringer, will not be liable for compensation of damages to the patent owner, provided that the defendants can prove it, can convince the court with evidence that the infringing product were purchased by the defendant from a legitimate legitimate source. It's not from a black market. So, in a sense, as a defense to damages, is only applicable to those who has purchased some infringing patented products and use it, offers to sell or sell it on the market. This defense would only limit the liability for compensation of damages. It means the innocent infringer might not be ordered to pay damages to the patent owner, but the innocent infringer would still be ordered to, to stop infringing by destroying the infringing products, stop doing the infringing acts, such as using the infringing products for commercial purpose, offering to sell or selling these infringing patented products. Well, let's move on to our last topic, remedies available in China. In case where a patent infringement is well established and the defendant has failed to maintain any defenses against the claim. The successful plaintiff, which could be the patent owner or the licensees of the patent, shall have the right to demand the infringement to be stopped. Usually, the successful plaintiff would be able to ask the court to issue an injunction. 
Number two, the ear effects of infringement be eliminated. For example, the infringing products must be destroyed. The raw materials or, or machines used to make the infringing products must be destroyed. Number three, damages be compensated. Under current Chinese law, there are five principal remedies, which are number one, injunctions. As we mentioned earlier, it's a general rule that the court would usually issue an injunction ordering the defendant to the infringer to stop the doing of any infringing conduct. But there are circumstances in which an injunction might be refused by the court. For example, if to stop the infringer from implementing the patent, from using the invention, would harm public interest or cause serious imbalance between the parties, the court may decide not to order the infringer to stop the implementing, but uh, instead to pay a reasonable use fee. Number two. Claims for reasonable remuneration for pre-grant use. In the case of uh, invention patents, a successful patent owner, the one who has patented the invention successfully, after the grant of the patents, can make a claim for reasonable fee if a party has been working the patents between the date of publication and issuance. You may still remember that in the case of invention patents, the patent rights is effective upon the date of granting, the date of issuance. However, the details of the inventions would already be made to the public upon the date of a publication. So between the date of a publication and the date of a grant, it could be over years. During this period, it's highly possible that someone who already had access to the details of the invention would uh, implement the invention. The implement implementing of the invention between this date of publication and issuance is not, in, in, is not an infringement upon the patent because before the date of issuance there was no patent at all. However, without um, a remedy available to the patent owner, it would be unfair for the patent owner. The current system says that for invention patents, if the patent owner has successfully patented the invention, may sue the, the party who has used the invention for the making of products. But uh, this is only applicable to invention patents, not to utility modules and design patents.
because you do the models and the design patterns are not substantively exempt and are granted on the date of a publication. So the date of a granting and the date of uh, publication of the utility module and the design patterns are the same day. Whereas in the case of uh, invention patterns, the date of uh, publication is much, much earlier than the dates of granting. The limitation period uh, for claiming reasonable remuneration fees or reasonable remuneration or, or fees is two years from the date when the patentee, the patent owner, knew or should have known of the infringing act, or if they know about it before the date of a grant, two years from the grant of the patent. Number three, damages. Article 25 of the Patents of China provides that damages for patent infringement should be assessed in one of the following ways. So the following approaches or scenarios to calculate the exact number of uh, damages. Number one, the damages could be calculated based on the lost profits of the patent owner due to the infringement. Number two, it could also be based on the infringer's gains from infringement. Number three, as the previous two scenarios to calculate and determine the amounts of infringements highly depends on the evidences provided by the plaintiff. There and it could be very difficult to establish these facts as of the loss of profits or all the gains generated from infringement. The new amendments of uh, patent law of China provides uh, for the third scenario to calculate damages, that is, the damages available to a plaintiff could be based on reasonable royalties or a multiple amounts of the royalties. That's in practice, if uh, a license contract giving permission to the use of the invention is usually, for instance, $10,000. Well, here in this case, if uh, there could be successful license conducted between the patent owner and the licensee, before the litigation, the courts may accept the amount of royalties stated in the license agreements as a base to calculate the loss or damages suffered by the plaintiff. Number four, in case where it's just impossible to make a final calculation of the amount of uh, damages given the lack of uh, evidences the court may exercise its uh, discretion ordering a uh, statutory damages from the amounts of uh, 10,000 to 1 million RMB The first remedy available to the one who has successfully sued 
the defendant for patent infringement is elimination of ear effects generated from the patent infringement. This can be achieved by asking the court to, de to destroy the raw materials, components, or all machines for the making of the infringing products, shutting down the factory, or simply to seize and destroy any infringing patented products available on the market. Number five, it might also be possible for a successful plaintiff to ask the court to issue an order to push the or to make the defendants, the infringer, to give an apology to the plaintiff by means of uh, publishing open letters or statements on news media or, or a website. Well, this is the entire lecture on patent law in China. In the following weeks, we will move on to trademark law in China and then to copyright law in China.